What if the number that frames our deep prehistory, 65,000 years, is wrong? For decades, 65,000 years has stood as the headline date for the first human presence in Australia, elevating Aboriginal Australians as one of the world's oldest continuous cultures. Now, new genetic research challenges that timeline. Where archaeologists point to stone tools and OSL dating at sites like Majed Baby, geneticists read a Neanderthal DNA timestamp that implies a later arrival after roughly 50,000 years. This piece explores the clash and possible reconciliation between stone and gene on the Ice Age supercontinent of Sahul, asking not just when people came, but how their arrival reshaped a continent and how it shaped them in return. Sea levels fall, coastlines fuse, and Sahul emerges, but the path in is anything but simple. Between Southeast Asia and Sahul lies Wallacea, a maze of islands separated by deep water gaps. No land bridge, only open sea. The task shifts from wandering to wayfinding, plotting headings across currents and monsoons, timing departures, and moving families, tools, and fire across horizons they couldn't see. Researchers envision island hopping through today's Indonesia, with staging points debated. A northern arc via Halmahera Seram Aru toward New Guinea's shores, or a southern arc via Timor across the Timor and Arafura Seas to Arnhem Land. Each asks for repeatable seafaring, memory of winds and swells, and social coordination to scale up from chance drift to deliberate voyages. The route is plausible. The date is the knot, one the next sections start to untie. The case for an early arrival crystallizes at Majed Bebe, a rock shelter in Australia's Northern Territory. In 2017, excavators reported stone tools, pigments, and hearths deep in the sequence. Materials, they argued, were laid down approximately 65,000 years ago. If right, the site vaults Sahul into the front rank of early, sustained human settlement and implies planning, symbolism, and seafaring on par with any Pleistocene society. The clock behind that headline is OSL, optically stimulated luminescence. Dating, sand grains surrounding artifacts store energy from ambient radiation once they're buried. When stimulated in the lab, they release light proportional to burial time. Multiple samples, cross-checks, and stratigraphic controls sought to pin the earliest occupation to that deep layer, away from later disturbances. Yet the very thing that preserves Majed Bebe, deep sands, also invites doubt. Grains and small artifacts can migrate downward over millennia, inflating apparent ages. Critics call the site an outlier relative to most dated Australian locales, clustered approximately 45 to 50,000 years ago, while supporters counter that careful excavation and parallel methods anchor the claim. The result is dramatic but precarious. A single site bearing a singular date, carrying the weight of a continental story. Then the genome speaks. Sequenced Neanderthal genomes and broad modern data sets show that all non-African populations carry a small but persistent Neanderthal signature, approximately 2%. Population genetic models place the main admixture as a single pulse in Eurasia, likely as Homo sapiens moved through the Levant into Western Asia, within a tight window around 50 to 45,000 years ago. The logic is blunt. If Aboriginal Australians share this signal, their ancestors must have passed through the admixture corridor after it happened. That creates a hard ceiling for first arrival, not earlier than approximately 50,000 years, unless an even earlier genetically distinct population reached Sahul and left no surviving lineage. In this framing, the genome functions as a timestamp, bracketing dispersal after the Neanderthal encounter. How does DNA tell time 
by tracking the decay of linkage disequilibrium around introgressed fragments and calibrating mutation rates with ancient genomes. The result dovetails with many dated sites clustered between approximately 45 to 50,000 years ago, tightening the knot around Majed Bebe's older claim. If the archaeology insists on approximately 65,000 years ago, genetics counters with a demographic twist, an early wave that faded, followed by the dominant post-admixture peopling that shaped today's aboriginal ancestry. This isn't a verdict. It's a methods debate. OSL is powerful yet sensitive to context. In sandy, bioturbated settings, grains and small artifacts can drift downward, inflating ages. Majid Bebe's team used multiple samples, cross-checks, and careful stratigraphy, but extraordinary claims demand extraordinary controls, and critics see an outlier pressing against the edges of what the sediment can securely say. Genetics, meanwhile, speaks in demography, not shovels. A plausible reconciliation is an early small wave into Sahul that left faint or no genetic legacy, then a later larger posted mixture wave that dominates present-day ancestry. Archaeology would record presence. Genetics would record persistence. And DNA isn't infallible. Molecular clocks hinge on mutation rates, population sizes, and admixture models still being refined, especially with scant ancient DNA from tropical contexts. The prudent stance, weigh stone and gene together, and expect revision. Just northwest of Sahul, caves on Sulawesi preserve hand stencils and animal figures dated to greater than or equal to 51,200 years. Minimum ages from uranium series tests on the thin calcite skins over the paintings. Minimum means the images could be older. Either way, symbolic behavior was flourishing in Wallacea, the same island maze any voyagers to Sahol had to navigate. That matters. Art implies communities capable of teaching, planning, and transmitting lore. Skills that also underwrite seafaring. It doesn't fix an Australian landfall date, but it shifts the center of gravity a cultural horizon near Sahol by approximately 51,000 years ago, plausibly tied to the same networks that probed open water. If Majed Bebe is debated, Sulawesi broadens the canvas, suggesting a region primed for earlier movement. Thread the strands together and a composite picture emerges. Wave one. Small, pioneering groups push through Wallacea earlier, testing sea gaps and leaving archaeological footprints. A hearth here, a tool there. But little genetic persistence. Their lineages diluted or absorbed by later arrivals. Wave two. A larger, post-admixture dispersal after approximately 50,000 years, demographically dominant, radiating along Sahul's coasts and rivers, and supplying most of today's ancestry. Between them lies a mosaic. Some regions see continuity, others replacement or assimilation. Sea levels pulse, coastlines shift, populations bottleneck and rebound, Founder effects amplify some lineages while extinguishing others. Archaeology is exquisitely sensitive to presence, genetics to survival, different sensors reading the same storm with different instruments. Such a model explains why a few early sites, and Sulawesi's art, hint at deeper time, while the genomic time stamp gathers the main peopling nearer 50 to 45,000 years ago. It also sets the stakes for what comes next. What kinds of evidence, new sites, tighter dates, better models, could break the tie? Two kinds of results would move the needle fast. Archaeology, an unequivocal multi-method date greater than 60,000 years from a well-sealed context, backed by micromorphology, single-grain OSL, Bayesian models, and replicable stratigraphy, at new sites in northwest Australia, New Guinea, or Sulawesi's outer arc. Genetics, 
tighter mutation rate calibrations, plus recoveries of ancient DNA, or sediment DNA proteomes, from tropical contexts, refining the Neanderthal admixture clock, and testing persistence versus replacement. Bridging tools, submerged shelf surveys, paleo sea level maps, agent-based demography, and voyaging simulations can link dates to feasible routes. A decisive falsifier? Either a rock solid greater than 60 Ka occupation after all disturbance tests, or pre-50 Koi genomic presence tied to Sahul, each would force a rewrite. Whatever date wins, 50,000, 65,000, or earlier, Sahul was no cul-de-sac. People flourished there, adapting to deserts, monsoons, and coasts, and sustaining some of the world's oldest living cultures. The debate isn't a verdict on worth, it's a sharpening of method. Read together stone records presence and gene records persistence, two instruments tuned to the same human story. Thanks for watching. If this helped you see the problem in a new light, consider sharing it. Stay curious. There's more to uncover.